Hello, I'm Bill McQueen. Welcome to No Password Required. How's this for a TV show premise? CSI meets Mr. Robot. That's increasingly what's happening in cybersecurity. It's called cyber forensics, and it's a rapidly expanding weapon in the war against cybercrime. We'll learn more on this episode of No Password Required. No Password Required is a presentation of Cyber Florida, located on the Tampa campus of the University of South Florida. Before we meet today's guests, we have an announcement and an introduction. We have a new co-host on No Password Required. He's Ernie Ferraresso, the Associate Program Director of Cyber Florida. Ernie, welcome. Thanks. We want to get into cyber forensics, but first, give us the elevator version of your background in cybersecurity. Well, uh, thanks, Bill, and I'm, I'm so glad to be here. I'm uh, the Associate Program Director at, at Cyber Florida, uh, but before that, in a, a previous life, I was in the, the Marine Corps for a, for a very long time, and I got involved in cybersecurity kind of a securitist route in that the, the Marine Corps said, uh, great, you have a degree in business management, so you're going to go into signals intelligence. Uh, which are completely unrelated, and when the is that an example of military intelligence? It's exactly correct. Okay. That's right. a, that's a precisely what's going on there. Uh, and when I asked, well, what is signals intelligence? The uh, the platoon commander said, I don't know, but it sounds cool. You'll be fine. Well, twenty years later, and uh, uh, in and around the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, I got to do cybery things before we were calling them cyber. Um, and uh, after I retired, I got worked in the private sector for a little while, and so now here I am now, uh, working at Cyber Florida, and I'm excited to be here. So you got into it because somebody said, this is what you're going to do, but but you stayed in it. What kept you in the field? What about cybersecurity? Well, I'll tell you, it's a, I had a, one of my commanders, he said the, the coolest thing once was, he said, if you like stealing somebody's lunch without them knowing about it, then you're in the right field. Um, and I got into it from the more the... Uh, the offensive side. Uh, we were in the business of, of breaking into other people's networks, predominantly you know, overseas adversaries, um, and trying to steal data and information from them. And so that's kind of why I stuck with it. So you took that background, that experience, and are now applying it in a defensive mode. Correct, okay. yes. Right. Yep. Let, let's introduce our guest. Our guest today on No Password Requires, the Grand Gardener. He's a former police officer, FBI agent, and consultant. The Grand has a doctorate in sociology with a criminology specialization from Virginia Tech. He's now director of the MF Cybercrime Program at the USF Department of Criminology and director of the Digital Forensics Program at the USF Office of Graduate Studies. His expertise, cyber forensics. The Grand, welcome to No Password Required. Hey, thank you, very glad to be here. On one level, the term cyber forensics is pretty self-explanatory, but the field is evolving and Based on our conversation before the show, there seems to be some misconceptions, some misconceptions about it. How would you define cyber forensics as opposed to cybersecurity in general? Well, in general, the, the probably the more accurate term for it completely is going to be digital evidence. And that applies to all the different ways it's, it's, uh, it's used. Uh, it's used in criminal investigations, it's used in civil investigations, it's used in administrative investigations. Um, and the way that it differs from traditional um, cybersecurity, so to speak, is that we are, um, rather than, say, going in and attempting to uh, restore a system or stop a system from being attacked, our goal is to find out about as much as we can, uh, or rather, find out as much as we can about the attack, um, who's doing it. Uh, I use the term archaeology a lot, and, and that's largely what we're doing. We're doing uh, cyber archaeology. We're going in and we're trying to rebuild what happened in the past and try to get uh, identify what happened so that we can maybe stop it in the future, find out who did it so maybe we can get a prosecution or whatever needs to be done. And uh, basically, essentially, we try to put all the pieces together of, of an event that took place sometime in the past. I want to get into how you do that and how it all works, but, but I have one question, and, and Ernie, you can weigh in on this as well. The people running companies, the people in charge of our government, in charge of military and, and law enforcement, do they rec are they recognizing what you do as a specialized field, or do they still tend to 
to lump you into IT or, or cybersecurity in general? Well, they're, they're trying. <laughs> I would say that. But I, I think it's, it's be, because of the way that it's grown up. The, uh, the field started probably about 30 years ago. In fact, uh, IASIS, which is one of the original uh, professional groups, is celebrating its 30th anniversary. Uh, I've mentioned before, we're just uh, starting in September 2014. We were uh, considered a, a science, or, or one of the first times classified as a forensic science by NIST. And so the way that it came was it was largely law enforcement practitioners, um, military practitioners, and, and, and basically a, a unique set of people applying this uh, in the field. And what took place then is uh, over the years, the, the nature of evidence changed, the rules changed. Uh, we have to uh, follow, uh, for instance, rules of evidence. We have to follow rules of procedure. Uh, we have to uh, follow scientific protocols. We have a lot of different things. So we, we can't just run out and, and gather evidence. We can't run out and just say, you know, this is evidence, we're taking this or that or another. There, there are a great deal of rules that, that we have to follow and they all, uh, if you were to think of any courtroom experience and, and the way that evidence of any kind gets admitted uh, into a court, we are bound by those rules. And so what takes, has taken place over the past 30 years, we sort of uniquely have become uh, a, a discipline within ourselves because of the, of the way that we've grown up and the, the, the restraints and the, the protocols that we have to follow. You mentioned this, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Yeah. Um, Ernie, as you were coming up in, in the military and, and when you got out of the military, you were aware of, of digital evidence and, and its growing impact? Yeah, when we were doing it, uh, we, didn't, we didn't really call it digital evidence so much as we were doing it in the sense of digital exploitation. It was the same type as what, what you were doing was we, we'd, uh, we'd look through captured uh, equipment, whether it's laptops, cell phones, and whatever, to look for further things for I intelligence value. Um, that would come to like you know, contact lists or evidence, you know, different, and then it would. So you had that level of uh, of information, but then we'd also go down. I would call it more to the, the on the technical level, like the 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 networking basics of it. What, how did this machine connect to whatever device? What were the protocols that were associated? When did it access? All those things, because that would then help us build the picture. Um, if we were going to try to a go after some person in that network, or you know, try to put uh, the network back together. Um, and one of the things I thought was interesting, you mentioned, uh, you know, that it's, a, it's an evolving field. One of the things that I've seen uh, is in, in current law enforcement, a lot of times it was, the, and you can tell me if this is true and if it's growing, is that, hey, uh, Officer Johnson, he happens to be smart on IT, so congratulations, you're now the digital forensics person. Go forward. Is that kind of how That's it's... how it happened with me. I'm, I, uh... <laughs> Actually, I was uh, computer literate from very early on. Actually, I had a PhD when I went into law enforcement, so it was well, that's the smart guy there. So let's uh, let's let's make sure that we uh, put him behind the computer and, and have him doing things. And that that is sort of the way that, that it did take place with me was I, I got I got pigeonholed early and mm. and as as need arose and and I remember one of the, one of the first cases I worked on. Uh, it was a pedophile who had a had a large server, and he was the actually the IT person for a for a corporation, and was running partially at the corporation. And uh, we, when we seized the server, they they needed somebody who could look at it uh, differently, uh, in a way that you know that would be admissible in a court of mm. law. And so I got tagged, and and uh, I've been with it ever since. And that was probably uh, just if I had to guess, that was in the mid '90s, something like that. But it, it, it becomes a different thing than what you were talking about also, yeah. the uh, get, going after digital forensics, uh, you know, or pursuing digital forensics for intelligence is also a lot different in that you do have a lot more freedom. You don't mm -hmm. have to work, concern yourself so much with the evidence protocols because you're not going to a court of law. Yeah. Uh, and, and you don't have to concern yourself with following the, the scientific rigor and, and things along those lines because you're looking for information to apply. And, and if, you don't, if you don't have to worry about ever going to court, you don't have to worry about when you're planning on building a case against someone, uh, there are a lot of rules that, have, that come into play and have to, have to be followed. And, and that's probably pretty much what makes digital evidence you know, what it is. And, and I use that term uh, as opposed to digital forensics because that's the term that NIST decided was officially was going to officially be mm. <laughs> digital forensics and and uh, and so I'm, I'm you know supporting NIST and, and supporting the the discipline by using the the scientific term that they prefer but you make an interesting point uh, 
digital evidence around for 30 years or more, mm -hmm. three decades. Yes. It was recognized as a science by NIST in 2014. Why did it take so long? I really couldn't tell you. I, th I think a lot of it had to do with, um, uh, in the early days, you didn't have the the, the scientific protocols. Um, I mean, they, they evolved over time. And I think what took place is you're talking about something that started at ground zero and over 30 years built into what was recognized as a, a science along you know, with DNA and, and, and anything like that, blood splatter, anything like that. It, it became suddenly a, 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 a scientific discipline that, that had its own uh, uh, rules of procedures, it had its own uh, uh, schools and, uh, and training programs. Certifications. Um, certifications things like and things along those lines. And, and it's only been within the past four to five years that it's actually become a, uh, well, once, once it became a, a science, digital evidence, it, it became recognized uh, within the, uh, the academic community as a subject of valid study. It's, it's more recently, uh, and you're starting to see now uh, digital evidence or digital forensics programs of virtually every university. Ten years ago, you weren't, you weren't going to find that. You said even some people refer to it or consider it kind of like a voodoo. Oh, yeah, they do. I, I, well, that, that we went through for <laughs> quite a while. Uh, it, it, many defense attorneys would... Uh, uh, many defense attorneys would uh, try to, to get us in the courtroom and they would be describing what we're doing and, and you know, to, to a jury of, of, of 12 people, you know, who believe, you know, when they hit that delete button that the file went away and they don't know that it's still there. You know, even when you mash that delete button, it didn't go anywhere. And, and you're trying to tell us that this thing actually is still there. <laughs> what kind of magic did you use to bring it back? You know, things <laughs> like that. And, and and they would, you know, they would use a voodoo analogy of what we were what we were doing. And and uh, it it uh, it took a while. And and I think people understand nowadays that that uh, the basics of computers. And I think the population in general, I, I believe most people now, for instance, know that, you know, when you delete a file, it's still there. And of course, it's now accepted in court. Yeah. It's accepted by law enforcement. Yeah. Very good. Um, Legram teaches digital evidence at, at the uh, at the University of South Florida, but we're going to talk about how that has changed cybersecurity. With no password required, continues. No password required is a presentation of Cyber Florida, located on the Tampa campus of the University of South Florida. We're back on No Password Required. I'm Bill McQueen, along with Ernie Ferraresso. And our guest today is cyber forensics and digital evidence expert, LeGrand Gardner. Uh, before the break, LeGrand, I mentioned we were talking about digital evidence. What do, you, what do we mean by that specifically? When you say digital evidence, what kind, of, what kind of things are we talking about? It can be the hardware. It can be the software. Um, it can include uh, uh, Video recordings, as long as they're digital. Uh, I mean, it, it can include audio recordings if they're digital. Virtually anything that involves uh, the, the digital realm. We even uh, roughly will include such things as uh, printouts, maybe that might be found on a search warrant in the garbage can, could be considered a form of digital evidence related to the case. Uh, so any anything that at all that's that's related to the uh, the computer and the uh, the production of evidence, and not just. The computer, uh, yeah. facial recognition, yeah. photos, crime scene yeah, photos, exactly everything, surveillance tapes. Okay, yeah. and and all right. So you you mentioned when we were talking before the show, use the term hash algorithms. Mm -hmm. What are those? Basically, it is a mathematical equation. I'm gonna keep it simple. <laughs> a mathematical equation that that produces a, a very unique uh, sum. And what we will, can do in, in digital forensics is we can run it against the evidence. Uh, for instance, if we want to verify a file, uh, we can run it against that file and we can get the what, and actually a lot of times it's referred to as digital DNA. And we get that file's uh, hash algorithm and it's permanent. If that file ever changes, for instance, we'll know that a change has taken place to the file. Um, it, they're used extensively in many different ways. One of them, for instance, uh, there's a, a collection of hash algorithms specifically for child pornography uh, that's maintained at the federal level. And we can, for instance, take a database of hash algorithms, run it against a computer with, you know, millions of files, and it'll spit out the ones that match the algorithms of the child pornography. And it saves us from having to sit down and look for specific files. Um, also, we, for instance, might uh, get a drive, and, and it, this is really a nice thing about... Um, 
uh, digital evidence that's so much different than others. If I have a hard drive, I don't have to analyze that exact hard drive. I can take the hard drive, I can get a hash algorithm for the entire drive, then I can make a copy of the drive, I get a hash algorithm for the copy. If the copy matches the original, then I can put the original in evidence or wherever and I don't ever have to worry about doing anything with it or being destroyed by accident or the, the drive breaking or, or whatever may take place and I can work with copies and the copies are considered valid because the algorithms match the original perfectly. And as long as the algorithm never changes, we know we're dealing with an exact you know, true copy. And this is for both of you. How, how accurate are they? How reliable? Well, um, let's put it like this. A fingerprint mm -hmm. is roughly one in, one in 60 billion chances of, of a collision that, a per, that two people will have the same fingerprint. One in 60 billion. Uh, the weakest hash algorithm, which is an M MD5, Message Digest 5, uh, the chance of, a, of an uh, accidental collision or two, two hashes matching uh, with, with different photos or different anything is one in 341 undecillion. That's a big number. That's, that's <laughs> an extremely large number. And I, I often make the joke, and I'm probably very wrong, but I, I don't know that much about probabilities, but you'd stand a, a greater probability of winning the lottery and being struck by the lightning at the same time. Which might happen, yeah. I, and I'd take the lightning hit. <laughs> <laughs> if the winning was big enough. Yeah, yeah. it was big enough. And, and you said there, so it's, a defense attorney can say all he wants, or she can say all exactly. she wants. It's reliable. Yeah. You said that one time uh, in a prosecution, I believe it was a pornographer or a child, it was, yeah. tried to say that you had manipulated evidence, yeah. and you were able to prove Yes, we can. We, tell, tell, me, tell us about that. And, and that's essentially how it is. Well, you get accused of a lot of different things, particularly by the defendants and their, their um, um, attorneys, and, and it's just part of the defense, and, and you have to get used to it. And that's one of the things of why we have the scientific rigor is so that we can show to the juries that this is how we arrived at it, we followed these procedures, and we did it. But uh, one, one example, for instance, is, is there, there's always the, the issue of did we, did we plant evidence? Did we, do it, did we go in and did we substitute, say, did we put a picture uh, uh, on, the, on a person's hard drive or something like that? And if I can sit there and tell them, with, with, you know, no, I hashed that drive and I found this on the, the, the copy that has the matching hash, there's absolutely no way that, the, that, the, that, you know, that that could have been done. Because all you have to do is just change one bit, one little teeny thing, the, the, the slightest change, and the algorithm will be completely different than the original. So altering a tape, altering a mm -hmm. photograph, adding some minor detail, altering, altering yeah. the date it was recorded, yeah. all that is detectable? Yes. And it's completely accepted by the court system, yeah, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, is it still challenged at all? or have, have Well, <laughs> defense attorneys are, are starting to get smarter. Uh, and realize they're spinning their wheels and wasting their time uh, doing that. Um, it, a lot of it's going to depend on, on the nature of the case, but, but when it comes down to the scientific standards, as long as you follow them, you're usually pretty safe. Uh, and that's one of the things that, uh, that I try to emphasize a lot with uh, um, students. With uh, any, Anytime I give lectures or speeches about the difference between, say, IT and this, IT and, and the professionals in NIT, they're not exactly trained as evidence technicians. Um, they don't really understand, you know, the things that, that, that we have to do separately or differently, like, so, you know, following how to extract certain evidence, how to preserve it, how to analyze it. Uh, we have a, a great deal of training that goes into it, proficiency-based uh, certifications. We have a, a basically a, a – it, I would refer to it as a profession. Um, but you just can't walk out there because you're knowledgeable of computers and, and do this. You, it takes a great deal of training and a great deal of experience. I've, I've known some uh, major law enforcement agencies in, in the country. You know, for instance, if a, if a person becomes a, a digital evidence technician or a digital evidence specialist, they will make them work for three years in a pr as an apprentice before they're even allowed to touch their first criminal case, um, and, and assuming they're willing to give that much time. <laughs> because, again, it's not something you just walk out and start doing tomorrow. And if you try walking into a courtroom, and, and I've, I've very fortunately, unfortunately, I'm not sure which, have run across many of these, these young people who were hired as, to come in and, and challenge me on my digital evidence, and 
they really have no clue what they're talking about because they don't have the training in the background. They don't even understand, you know, what the rules of evidence procedure is or anything along those lines. So it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that the courts have recognized, and um, it's it not very challenged very often at all as long as you follow the rules. Where they get you really is if you take shortcuts or if you do things you shouldn't have done. Or well, really and, like and, any and, police and, work. And rightfully so, yeah, and rightfully so if you, if you do that. And and uh, it's 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 a lot different too. With the um, you know, not only can we work with with co- copies that have been validated, you know, by by things like the hash algorithm. Uh, there's a lot of difference. And, and working on a, a crime scene, for instance, by the time say you get to a crime scene, a regular crime scene, let's say you've got a homicide there, something along those lines. Uh, by the time you've got EMS in and out of there, rolling the body over, they they've stepped on the evidence 20 times. You got you first. You have the the onlookers that came in and the looky loos. Then you you've got the 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 uh, you got all the medical people and then you've got detectives and then you know this is all the stuff you can imagine all the stuff that goes in. There. We're getting a computer and if we treat it right, we don't have all those people stepping on all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you think about it, the evidence from a crime scene like a homicide is still good after all those th- after all those changes after all those things because they follow the protocols that they're supposed to. So if we're looking at a, a drive or we're looking at a piece of media or we're looking at anything and we've been following the protocols, we've actually about the only person that could step on it is going to be us. Mm-hmm. And if we can prove that we didn't, then we got a, a really good strong case. You mentioned something that, that really kind of got me thinking. Um, you, you mentioned that the physical, like the hard drives and such, how do you, how do you deal with the with the, with the cloud, uh, you know, especially when you're talking, the evidence is, you know, it's on somebody else's, it's quote on somebody else's machine. Subpoenas. Uh, yeah, so you have to subpoena <laughs> Largely. them. And it's, uh, cloud forensics has been a challenge. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting that, that, I'm probably going on a slight tangent here, but cloud forensics is one, a specialized field now. Mm. When, when I first started, uh, we, we did this thing that we used to refer to as dead box forensics. And dead box forensics was you just went and seized the computer and you, you analyzed it. Uh, since then, now we've got network forensics, we've got malware forensics, we've got cloud forensics, we've got uh, the Internet of Things, IoT mm-hmm. forensics. Um, you've got uh, vehicle forensics is real big right now because people oh, plug yeah. their phones and everything into yep. their cars. Being able to take the, the digital uh, evidence out of a vehicle and use it is, is amazing. And all of these now are specialized fields that people actually work in, they train in, and and it's kind of I, I admit to people all the time, you know, I, I can't do all that. Yeah. <laughs> I can do one or two things. I can do what I was trained in. I can do what I I I've got experience in. Um, but the field has exploded so much now that people are specializing, much like much like medicine or like anything else. That that you back back in my day and time when I was actually practicing. It was very easy to be a, a jack of all trades, and and that's impossible now. Mm-hmm. You you cannot do that. And one of one of the things that we have in the profession, uh, we we have uh, listservs with professionals. And like for instance, today I, I was watching several different uh, discussions going on, uh, people talking about various various specialties. And those people who are trained in those specialties will get on there and share their information mm-hmm. and knowledge. And it's it's the only way it's gonna it's gonna happen because this has just really become so big. And and wherever you go, whatever you do, you leave digital prints nowadays. Absolutely. It's yeah. it's impossible not to, and it's exploded to the point where a lot of that is sometimes needed in evidence, be it be it civil, criminal, or or, uh, or administrative in nature. So it's it's one of those kind of things that uh, it's it's just amazing. There's so much knowledge out there that that uh, no one person can do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm struck by not only do you have to have the technical expertise to extract evidence. You have to know chain of custody yeah. for evidence. You have to know uh, how do you present it in court. Exactly. So it's, it's a very specialized field. Criminals have to know that. They know, for instance, if I'm smart enough or, or skilled enough to hack into a system, mm-hmm. I know that I can't delete something and it's not going to be there. How are, you, how are they changing to adapt to what you can do? Well, you know, there is the theory that we only catch the dumb ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to what extent that's true. I mean, I've 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 met some very challenging, but but the reality is, and this is probably less of a theory and more of a of a observation on my part, is that you have to be as skilled, experienced, and and as good as the person you're going after. 
And, you know, when you begin that, that chase through cyberspace or whatever it is that you're engaging in, uh, you have to be their peer. You have to match them at a level. Uh, there, there are probably, because if they're, if they're better and capable of outsmarting you, you're never going to know that they were there. Uh, it's it's uh, it, one of those things that uh, it, it's a good, I, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say this because it's true. This is a great day and time to be a cyber criminal. <laughs> because all you have to do is the try golden it. years of yeah, cybercrime. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All you have to do is it's it's early on. Mm -hmm. There's not enough law enforcement out there. Technology is changing rapidly, faster than the ability to produce people who can investigate it. And if you can stay ahead of that curve, you can stay ahead of the investigations with your skill sets and your your knowledge. You can do virtually anything that you want to. Well, that kind of plays into what Ernie was talking about. You you took your experience as a a, a white hat. Uh, hacker, mm. and now you're trying to, to prevent and get ahead of the people that uh, are the black hats. Yeah, and I think it's that's interesting. You know, the, you, you mentioned how it's, 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 it's growing so rapidly. I was just starting to think about it in the sense of some people probably think that, oh, digital evidence, you're going in and trying to find evidence of people breaking into computers. And in reality, it's your, I would, I would imagine, uh, that uh, the bulk of the investigations nowadays are starting to look for, you mentioned th those digital footprints. Yeah. Uh, and I can see it out in the future of you come across a, a, a murder scene and somebody wants to know, well, was so-and-so actually there? Well, let's go check the refrigerator to see yeah. if they open the refrigerator. I mean, and that, I, I can only imagine that that's, like you said, that's going to explode the need for these folks. And so as these regular, be done. yeah, are they, so are we going to have to start to see where, um, uh, I'll use the term, you know, regular police have some sort of a training in basic digital evidence collection or digital evidence that's, recognition. That's my belief. Yeah. And, and I, I can tell you from having, you know, started doing this well, a long time ago uh, and not seeing as much growth that as needs to be. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of the, one of the problems in law enforcement that we have is we like to compartmentalize everything. Yeah. And we like to take two or three people and say, well, you're going to do this. And, and I, I grew up and started in the day and age of, um, of, of community policing back in the 80s. And, and, of course, there were lots of government grants. So every, every agency in the world went and got a community policing unit. And they took two or three people. They got the little soft polo shirts. They gave them some balloons. They gave them some candy and gave them some bicycles. And then so, you know, instead of, instead of getting a clown on a pony for your kid's birthday party, you call the local <laughs> the police the show community up. thing. And yeah. they, they've done the same thing with, with digital forensics. They take one or two people and they put them there. Well, one of my arguments way back in that day was, so if you're not in that unit, are you anti-community police? You know, if you wear a badge, you are a community police officer. You serve the community. And the same thing now, the, the forensics has reached the point, or, or the digital age we live in has reached a point, if you wear a badge, you're a cyber cop, whether mm -hmm. you want to be or not. You don't have a choice. Um, it and it comes down to, are you a good yeah, cyber cop or a bad exactly. cyber Exactly. And everybody needs to be trained on there. They need to train the basics in the academy of how to, how to preserve evidence, how to collect evidence, how to, the, everybody that wears a badge needs to know how to do this. And that's one of the ways that we are going to eventually catch up to and make it a bad day would be a, a cyber criminal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things that needs to be done. And we're still not doing it. Though. We're, I want to follow up on something uh, Ernie touched on about it's not just computers. You told the story uh, about someone who broke in through an air conditioning yeah. system. T tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, well, that was the, uh, and, and I don't have any of the details with me, but if you remember several years back, the um, Target Corporation was hacked, mm -hmm. and they lost millions of, of customer credit card numbers and, and everything. And it's the, basically one of those Internet of Things is, is they had a real good, solid security system uh, in terms of their, uh, their, their computers, but all the, the bad guys did was they hacked in through the air conditioning system, and the air conditioning system was was uh, it tied into their computer mm -hmm. system. They used that vulnerability in the air condition, the linkage between the air conditioning and their computer, and they got in and they were able to to lift those com those uh, those uh, com those all those credit card numbers, yeah. which became one of the more famous uh, uh, examples of hacking, yep. you know, in, in in the world. But it's uh, very easy now to to get in through different things. I I can uh, I I very recently was staying at a hotel and and saw that they had their computer system you know one of the things i do whenever i go to a hotel i probably shouldn't say this i look to see what networks are available yeah. <laughs> you do it too yeah. <laughs> and and their 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 air conditioning system wasn't wasn't uh wasn't secured 
And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, if, if I don't know if it's standalone mm. or if it's tied into their databases or whatnot. But before I let the host, to somebody, yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. It could be connected to a bridge in in, yeah. <laughs> in New York City. You don't know. That's right. The, the way the Internet of Things run. And mm-hmm. and so I, I before I left, I went and sat down with the, with the manager and said, you need to secure your your air conditioning <laughs> system. Your it, it, anybody can get in there and do. And if they just wanted to crash it, so your customers had a bad night, they could do that. Um, and, and, so, uh, what was his reaction? Do, do people appreciate when you point that out, or they, just, they... they kind of stared at me and, and said, We're, "We'll have to get our people working on it." And I said, "We'll call IT." Yeah, That's exactly. What we'll call <laughs> IT. So. Okay. So, so what happens when a digital forensic investigator, when when someone's brought in to look for digital evidence, what happens when that person's brought into a criminal case? We'll find out when no password required continues. No Password Required is a presentation of Cyber Florida, located on the Tampa campus of the University of South Florida. With Ernie Ferraresso, I'm Bill McQueen, and our guest is LeGrand Gardner. This is No Password Required. So, somebody's system has been hacked through the air conditioning system, through the email, through the computer system. Somehow, a bad guy got into their system. Someone like you has called in. What's the first thing you do? Well, there's a whole joke we do in the police academy when we would uh, <laughs> when we try to catch people. The first thing you do is you park your car safely. <laughs> the first step. <laughs> yes, the very first step. Such as this. <laughs> uh, the it, it's it's actually depends on what's needed. Very often the 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 ad evidence, the digital evidence technicians being brought in for a specific thing. One of the one of the new emerging fields, and I know if, a, a few minutes ago I. I relates several different subfields that are just starting, and, and uh, one of them is, is incident response. Now, incident response has been around for decades, ages, and, and again, mainly what they do is attempt to go in and secure systems, make them stable, make them healthy, restore them, whatnot. Uh, now, it's starting to be realized, you know, that it's good to have information about it, so a lot of times in the process of, of stabilizing systems or stopping the attack, much of the evidence is destroyed. So. A new field of incident response is where they do bring along uh, uh, people with specializations in digital evidence and incident response so that while they're in the process of securing the systems or stabilizing the systems, they can also collect evidence simultaneously and it's, it's not lost. And that's, that's a growing field that's just exploding like crazy right now. Um, and, and I wish I had more skills in it because I'd like to go back and, and work in it myself. But it, in general, if you were just called to a scene of a, of a crime, one of the one of the first things you, you there are several things you have to do. First is you need to let, let's say I want to lock down a system or, or close a system, and let's say this is uh, an ongoing attack right now. The attack's over, and I need to I need to collect my artifacts. One of the first things I want to do is is get anybody away from the, the computer that I possibly can. Uh, that includes the subjects or, or anybody that might uh, be be suspect. Um, or the first officers on the scene. Or the first officers on the scene also and, and, and clear the area. I then need to make sure that there's not any in, incoming or outcoming connections. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've got several stories where I made that mistake in the past and I thought I had secured it and I didn't. I, I had one bad case where I, I failed to secure a system and when the bad guy came and, and saw that uh, there were police cars outside his house, he just went in, went in. And, and, and deleted everything. Okay. from. He was, he was sitting out in the yard and deleting off of, off of a laptop of what we had on the inside of the house. You know, it's those things you learn, you know, over the over the years, uh, and, and you make some mistakes. And I've made, made quite a few, and I can say I, that's, the, that's the good part where experience comes in once you've learned. Uh, but once we've secured those, then we need to decide what's going to be done with it. Uh, it, it also is going to depend on um, what the court order says, the search warrant. You, in some cases, you'll get some judges who require that a preview be done on the scene, um, some to make sure that there's signs of evidence. Some some judges will tell you just go ahead and take it back to your your uh, your evidence lab, whatever you need to do. So it, it's it's a series of stages that, that starts with basically securing the scene, securing the the uh, the evidence, uh, preserving it properly, transporting it properly, getting it back to the to the. Uh, to the uh, uh, lab and, and, and analyzing it properly. If you're dealing with, say, a large corporation, you're, of course, not going to shut it down. You're not going to interfere with their business and, or things along those lines. And that's where that specialty really comes in of, of people who, who specialize in forensics and incident response simultaneously. Yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned that, that incident response and talking about the, the, uh, the, the cyber police of the future and in, in, in because typically, if you're rolling up to execute a search warrant, you're going to isolate the 
the area. And now you have to think about it in the sense of isolating the area in cyberspace to pre prevent that same exact thing from, hey, you're coming in through the front door, you know, the suspect may be going out through the back door, or you're going in through the front door and the suspect is exfiltrating all the stuff out yep. via his Microsoft 365 account. Oh yeah, and, and they can be they can be sending it to the cloud, they can be, they, I had a case one time where they had a uh, had a wireless uh, stored in a neighbor's attic. A wireless yeah, uh, across the street, yeah. yeah. And, and that, <laughs> that's where they were keeping the child porn was in the neighbor's attic. Yep. And, and so <laughs> you, you really don't know what you've got until you get there and you start looking around and you, you start trying to to feel it out and put the pieces together. $64,000 question. Are we seeing more prosecutions as the result of the, the work that you and people like you do? I Yes, without a doubt. I, I think lar largely for several reasons. One, you have the prosecutions because people are being better trained in the investigations. Uh, you have the prosecutions because we have developed the, the, the scientific protocols and the specialized body of knowledge. Um, we do have profession, the per professional certifications. Um, all these things are starting to come together now, so that so that it's being accepted, you know, as a as a science. Uh, there's a uh, there's a, a a lot of of stories that anybody who's ever worked in the field can tell you uh, of old days where where the you know the the um, defense attorneys could really manipulate a jury in, into believing what you're doing was voodoo. And I, I really think those days are over for the most part. And, and I think people are, are starting to accept, and I think jurors also are becoming more more, mm. uh, more uh, intelligent with regard to these things. Well, uh, the whole American culture, North American culture, and, and maybe the world in general, all becoming more, uh, more digitally uh, uh, intelligent. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, you can be an expert witness. Yeah. Uh, you can... Uh, um, testify as far as getting a, uh, or give an affidavit for yeah. a subpoena. But unlike a lot of physical crimes where the person who committed it is probably in the vicinity, I mean, the the perpetrator of a cyber crime could be across an ocean, yeah. could be on another continent. Sure could. How does that impact what you do? It makes it very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and, and particularly when you're talking about citizens of other countries, because then you... You can't you, just go after them. You can't just go after them, and you usually have to work through, if, if they're even worth pursuing... Uh, from that point, in terms of expense and everything else, uh, you, you usually have to go through uh, a, a lot of um, agencies and, and a lot of uh, diplomatic uh, routines and, and procedures. Um, it's and you're right, virtually anywhere they can be in, in the world. There's it's it's very difficult to even uh, nail those cases down, much less uh, get a conviction. The science of digital evidence, as we've talked about, it's a very specialized field. But Legrand says he'd like to see it. Maybe a little less so. We'll explain when No Password Required continues. No Password Required is a presentation of Cyber Florida, located on the Tampa campus of the University of South Florida. Our guest today, LeGrand Gardner. Thank you for joining us on No Password Required. I'm Bill McQueen, along with Ernie Ferraresso. You've talked about you want every cop to be a cyber cop. Mm -hmm. Is that happening? Do you see progress in that regard? A little bit, but not a lot. I'm not alone, but they need uh, they need police to engage in a lot of different things, and and a lot of times uh, cyber is is on the bottom of the list. In your experience, you've been doing this for thirty years. How is cyber crime changing? If if it is first, is it changing? How is it changing? I believe it's getting easier to commit, <laughs> easier to conceal. Really, really, with all the public knowledge yeah. and, and what, what makes you say that? Well, uh, you could probably go out today and and stop any 10 people walking around and ask them do they have a firewall do are, are they using virus programs uh and and i'm going to guarantee you some are going to say no they're not uh, a lot of people just prefer the the simplicity of computers and and aren't as vigilant as they should be uh it's it's a it's a very common common thing that you find that, that when we used to we used to get a lot of people a lot of times what the child porn uh uh people who deal in it and sell it one of the things they'll do is they'll they'll ride around and and uh, they'll find open servers open computers and like for instance if, if i wanted to not i but if i were one and i wanted to say trade with my buddies i have some pictures i want to give my buddies you know i can park outside of a uh, of a uh, complex say an apartment complex i can scan find all these computers that are not password protected or or they're or or, or otherwise uh, would prevent me from getting in 
and I can log into their systems and I can send my child porn or whatever I'm doing, anything. It can be any type of crime all over the world and it comes back. So then when the officers are now doing the, uh, doing the background and trying to find out and they get this IP address and it comes back to an apartment. And you go to the apartment. I can tell you how many times this happened that, that, that you know we would show up with search warrants and and look at the, look at the uh, the router and look at the computer and say this is it. And it turns out that you know what it was was just somebody at two o'clock in the morning driving through the parking lot looking for uh, a computer that was unprotected. And they're, they're very common. If you were to you were to take a, a uh, an instrument, you could ride around, and we've mm-hmm. done it many times before, and just look at all the computers that around you that, are, that don't have protection of any kind. And there there are so many out there, um, and that's why I say it's it's getting it's getting easier. But uh, the criminals are getting smarter, uh, and the uh, and the opportunities are opportunities yeah. are great, and and the technology is getting easier to use. It used to be a day and time too, where you had to be really good to do this to be a criminal. And now you can go on some of these uh, some of these less than uh, <laughs> above board websites, and and you don't even have to write a program. You can buy a program that allows you to commit Heck, the crime. You can rent you it. To. You can rent yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, you can you can outsource it. Pay yeah. somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's the the availability is there. It's the digital equivalent of someone going through a parking lot looking for unlocked cars, yeah. mm-hmm. checking which doors are unlocked. Except now they're doing it digitally. Yeah. How is your field changing. Where do you see it going in the future? How, what, in the next five, ten years, what will we be talking about that maybe is not available now? I, I think you're going to see it starting to, to basically uh, explode exponentially in terms of practitioners, in terms of uh, technology available. Uh, one of the things is a lot of agencies don't engage in it because they can't afford the technology. Mm. And so they try to – it takes money to – it takes technology to investigate technology, and technology is expensive. <laughs> That's right, it's like that. Yeah. And so then they rely on other agencies, larger agencies. Well, those agencies have their own cases. They have their own priorities. Um, and I think what you're going to start to see is a lot more federal monies maybe, hopefully, that, you know, will go to smaller departments to allow them to start their own labs, to allow them to start their own training programs, uh, to, to, to basically uh, allow the – the the uh, the every badge to tool up and 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 prepare for it. One of the things I think you're going to see a lot of it, it, that's it, I'm, I I can't say it's all that new because it's not all that new. But we have the the civil and the uh, and administrative realms. Virtually every major corporation out there now to include to include the NFL for example has a digital forensics unit, mm. and they all have these units because uh, just like just like with criminal matters. Uh, if I want to fire somebody or I want to sue somebody and whatever they did is now on uh, in, in the digital realm, I don't have to follow these standards and procedures that have been established in courts of law. So I now, you know, back, back in the day when you could just walk in the office and say, you know, I caught you sending a bad email to so-and-so, you're out. Well, you can't anymore. That person's got one thing. They've got a right to their job, property right with their job. And again, the, it has to be collected off the computer, following a scientific protocol. Has to be retrieved, following that. It has to be preserved. Everything has to be in place. Otherwise, it, it's not admissible in a court of law. And the same thing with civil. If I want to sue a corporation for something, and I need the digital evidence against them, it's going to have to be extracted by by a professional who knows what they're doing. There are many, many agencies, private private contractors out there now who do nothing but collect data. Uh, all day long. The, this field, that field of, of civil is, is gained the name e-discovery, um, and it is just, it is going so fast. And it's probably because it came along almost on the, uh, I mean, I'm not going to say the tail end, but the, you know, law enforcement had been around for a while, and then the, then the, the, the standards sort of became set in the, the jurisprudence, and now you're starting to see the e-discovery start to explode. And the same thing with the managerial and, and, and things along those lines. You're, you're starting to see administrative investigations now requiring that, that if you're going to go to court or you're going to do some legal proceedings of any kind that involves any form of digital technology, you're going to have to follow the scientific protocols and you're going to have to use people who are uh, certified and skilled and, and capable of producing the, the desired results. But those people are going to be in high demand. Yeah, they are. They're extremely high demand. Before I wrap up, is there anything we want to talk about? I was going to say, what, if somebody wants to get into the field, what, uh, what do you tell them? How do they start? Well, it depends on how they want to get. We, um, it, be, because of the, the beginnings of it, the, the way that it started, 
and because it's only recently, and by recent I mean five, six, seven years, that it's become a legitimate academic subject for study, probably the, the standard or the gold standard in digital forensics at this time is still a, the, the proficiency-based certifications. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so whereas I strongly recommend and highly recommend formal education and go to college and, and specialize in it, you also need to get get your digital certifications in from from a a, a place that, that's really um, good mm -hmm. that's accredited. Um, you can have zero experience, you know, in in terms of education, and get a certification, and that'll carry a lot more weight. More weight, yeah. And and so I, there, I guess what I'm saying there are numerous avenues to get into the uh, business. Um, it really depends on what's right for you, what's right for your background. And, and and what uh, what you're willing to do, but down the road, my my ideal practitioner is going to have a college degree in it. Uh, the ideal practitioner is going to have a, a journalized um, uh, proficiency-based certification that's that's uh, non uh, that, that's not associated with a vendor of any kind. Mm -hmm. that basically tests for a set of knowledge, and then the ideal practitioner is going to be certified in all the tools they use. And to me, that would be the ideal. That that would be the person that could stand up under that. That, that person would be ironclad in a court mm -hmm. of law. There's very little that they could do to attack him, him or her, as long as as long as that person didn't do something dumb. Dumb, dumb. Yeah. But if they've got all that training and certification, they shouldn't have. Grant, yeah. thank you very much. Legrand Gardner has been our guest today on No Password Required. We've been talking about cyber forensics and specifically the science of cyber evidence. Now, if there's a topic you'd like to learn more about in the field of cybersecurity, let us know. You can contact us at info at nopasswordpodcast.com. That's info at nopasswordpodcast.com. This has been No Password Required. For Ernie Ferraresso, I'm Bill McQueen. Thank you for joining us. No Password Required is a presentation of Cyber Florida located on the Tampa campus of the University of South Florida. To hear other episodes of No Password Required, visit cyberflorida.org backslash podcast.